and higher sight chatters, bringing the heat and getting into the meat and charting another course across the vast conspiracy from sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood. And in this modern era, it seems that the oily appendages of the nefarious few are tightly wound around every sad and backward sector of our society. And while we wave the flag of freedom, we have systematically slipped into an Orwellian nightmare surveillance state, being processed like cattle at every major gathering, being poked, prodded, and scanned just to get on a routine flight, and cheering on the arrival of facial recognition technology and cameras on every street corner. And that's just at home. Never mind the perpetual war cycle, the harvesting of our community chest for the endless cost of the military-industrial complex, and the countless loss of life that is stacked up in the wake of their never-ending operations. It's a sad situation that can clearly be rolled back to the true catalyst in 2001, the tragic events of 9-11, where the sinister psychopaths of the power pyramid put in motion a covert operation to craft the world they wanted, carried out their false flag attack, and have been feeding off the trauma they created ever since. We know the official story is full of holes, falling apart even under the most mildly critical eye, but many unanswered questions still remain. Or that is to say they did until the recent release of The Trigger, David Icke's 800-plus page book, breaking down the entire event and the death cult network behind it. With a level of detail and clarity I have found nowhere else. You can get a copy of The Trigger or any of his outstanding books and video presentations on his website, davidike.com. And lucky, lucky for us, he's back in the higher side saddle and ready to ride. So let's get into it. You know him, you love him. A true conspiracy culture staple and the waker of the masses, the renegade himself, David the Dot Connector Ike. Welcome back to THC. Oh, thanks, Greg. What a great introduction. <laughs> I try. Thank you. And I appreciate you coming back so soon. You are a man of your word, and you are not kidding about the level of detail in The Trigger. Definitely one of the biggest books I have now. Honestly, given all the epic level work you've done at this point, I wondered if we really needed another 9-11 book in 2019. Obviously, the people hanging out here are well aware that the official story is a big lie. But where The Trigger really shines for me is with the questions of who really did it and why. Because I haven't heard of anyone framing up this network and its origin the way you do in this book. Well, the book is two books. Um, the first half of the book demolishes the official story of 9-11 um, from uh, the perspective of taking each aspect of it and taking it apart, which basically leaves no aspect that stands up. But the second half of the book, as you say, tells an amazing story, um, picking it up uh, in the uh, 17th century and bringing it through to who actually did it and why. And, of course, uh, part of the, that section details the scale of censorship that is going on worldwide, particularly in the West, um, to stop... Um, this death cult, which is what it is, being um, revealed, and I'm sure we'll get into that as we go along, uh, what that censorship is and, 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 and why it's being done and how it's being done, because uh, the United States is, is absolutely controlled um, in terms of the, uh, the Washington uh, establishment by this death cult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Obvious, yes, and you can clearly see how the agenda that has rolled out since 9-11 definitely can it can all be brought back to, as you say, the trigger. And a lot of people speculate on who's to blame. Some say Saudi Arabia, some say Israel. And it turns out that, you know, as far as your work has shown, these are just two heads of the same snake, a snake that might have many heads. Well, it, it does. And um, you can start to see um, why there was such a um, Saudi Arabian input into 9-11 in terms of the uh, alleged alleged hijackers most of them were Saudi Arabian and uh, there have been uh, efforts of course to um, take on Saudi Arabia and their involvement through the courts but um, unless you connect the dots uh, you can you can miss the real target and um, what I do in uh, the trigger is um, pick up this death cult um, in the 17th century and a man called Sabatai Zevi. 
Sabbatai Zevi was a uh, Sephardic Jewish man who claimed to be the Jewish Messiah. Now, um, what happens when you say something like that is, you're anti-Semitic, you are. Right, that's, that's the defense mechanism, which we'll get into. Actually, the opposite is the case in terms of uh, Zevi, because he started a cult um, which became known as Sabbateans and Sabbateanism, which actually um, is the very inversion of mainstream Judaism. Um, this uh, Sabbatean cult, um, and at one point, and by the way, everything I'm going to say in relation to this uh, Zevi and the cult comes from Jewish sources, because there are people in the Jewish community who absolutely know this is true. Not enough, but they absolutely know this is true. And so you have this um, Zevi cult, which inverted everything. So, for instance, if in Judaism uh, a particular day was a feast day, uh, or sorry, a fast day, then um, in Sabbateanism it would be a feast day. Now, yeah. you may not think that that's too much of a problem uh, on that level, and it's not. But once you get into this whole inversion uh, cult, then lots of other things far more serious start to come up. For instance, if it um, is a taboo for uh, sex with children, and it's a taboo to have um, incest with children within families, then under Sabbateanism, it is not only not a taboo, it is encouraged, it's part of their culture. And what happened with Zevi? He was operating in the uh, Ottoman Empire, um, and he was in what is called Turkey uh, uh, today, the state of Turkey. And um, at, at, at the height of this cult, um, uh, this is again, according to Jewish sources, he had about a million followers. Now, just, you know, take that on. That's a million followers in the 1600s. Yeah. And um, eventually the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire said to Zevi, look, either you convert to Islam or you ain't going to be around for very long. So he decided to convert to Islam, and many of his followers did as well. But convert to Islam only on the surface, uh, because um, they continued to practice their Sabbateanism, their inversion of Judaism, um, in secret. And these people that um, uh, converted, these Sabbateans that converted on the surface, became known as Donma or Donme which means to turn, to convert, in other words. And this um, stream um, operates within Islam to this day. And one major aspect of this stream of Sabbatean cultists um, who are practicing their uh, uh, cult, their basically sat satanic cult within Islam, is better known today as the Saudi royal family. Um, the British Empire um, that put the Saudi uh, House of Saud into power because they wanted to hijack the centers of the um, Islamic uh, uh, religion in uh, Mecca and Medina, um, they um, uh, worked with the House of Saud, which eventually uh, controlled that whole area. But they also introduced to the House of Saud um, a man called Wahhabi, and um, he was a Sabbatean. And uh, from Wahhabi, whose daughter married into the Saudi royal family, we get Wahhabism, which is um, this extreme version of Islam, which is practiced and imposed where? In Saudi Arabia. This is the head chopping, hand chopping version of Islam, which manifests as ISIS Islamic State, which is funded by who? the House of Saud, among others, um, including the uh, United States. Um, and, and so um, another uh, step, the next step in this Sabbatean cult, the next major step, was the arrival in the 18th um, century of a man called Jacob, um, uh, Jacob Frank. Jacob Frank um, claimed to be the reincarnation of um, Sabbatai Zevi, 
and also the reincarnation of the biblical patriarch um, Jacob. And uh, what um, happened then, and this is again from Jewish sources, is he um, took Sabbateanism into still greater depths, both of depravity and of um, expansion. Because one of the things that um, uh, Frank started to do was to um, convert Sabbateans uh, and from this time on they were known as Sabbatean Frankists as they are to this day, uh, convert them to Roman Catholicism and Christianity. So they, 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 they took over the, the Vatican, etc. And this is the modus operandi of Sabbatean Frankists. They infiltrate communities, they infiltrate religions, claiming and outwardly behaving as if they're one of that community and one of that religion, while um, advancing and using that um, that religion community as uh, a means to advance the Sabbatean Frankist agenda, which is total global control. And um, Jacob Frank got together with a guy called uh, Mayer Amstel Rothschild, the founder of the Rothschild um, dynasty, uh, the Rothschilds were called Bauer until Mayor Amstel Rothschild came in, or Mayor Amstel Bauer, as he was, and uh, he changed the name to Rothschild, and it was um, uh, named after um, a sign or a symbol on their house in Frankfurt. The symbol was the Star of David, um, and Rothschild in German actually means red shield or red sign, so that's where the very name comes from. And that, that um, symbol from which Rothschild comes is, of course, on the flag of Israel, which is um, the fiefdom of the Rothschilds. And the fiefdom, in terms of its controlling elite, of this Sabbatean Frankist cult, because um, it was uh, this um, uh, death cult that was behind the creation of Israel. And what they've done is... Uh, seize control through this infiltration of um, the Jewish community, while the vast majority of Jewish people have no idea who these people are. And, and um, they have been persuaded to um, go in a certain direction um, when actually uh, it's not for the reasons that they're being told. It's not to fulfill biblical prophecy or any of that. Um, it's to advance this cult. And this is why the Rothschilds were absolutely central, totally central to the creation of um, Israel. For instance, um, in the um, latter part of the 19th century, a secret society was created in Britain called the Round Table. And its first head was Cecil Rhodes, who plundered Southern Africa for the Rothschilds with the, the gold and the, uh, the diamonds. And um, the uh, Round Table Secret Society was funded by the Rothschilds. And in um, the, at the time of the First World War, we had the, um, the Balfour Declaration. Uh, this was the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Balfour, declaring, um, and, you know, the Balfour Declaration, it would seem that he stood up in Parliament or something and declared uh, 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 that the British Empire supported a homeland for Jewish people in uh, Palestine. But actually, the Balfour Declaration was a letter. And it was a letter sent by Lord Balfour to Lord Rothschild, um, saying that the British Empire supported this homeland for Jewish people in Palestine. That's what history tells you. What history doesn't tell you is that Lord Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary, was an inner circle member of this um, uh, Roundtable Secret Society. And the Roundtable Secret Society was funded by the Rothschilds. Um, and so it, it goes on and goes on until um, Israel was created. Now, uh, the vast majority of people in Israel think that it's Israel and why it was created was about 
um, you know, fulfilling biblical prophecy, like I say, but it wasn't. It was to be a a, a point of um, the, the centre point of control by this Sabbatean Frankist cult. And going on to what I said earlier, this is why you would think that Israel, the Israeli government, um, kind of representing Judaism and the Saudi royal family representing Islam would actually be in great conflict. But they haven't been. Un under the surface, they have been working as one unit. And this has become more obvious with the arrival of this new crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, who's, who's basically runs Saudi Arabia now, the guy behind the uh, horrific uh, killing of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, the um, Saudi dissident journalist. Um, and, and so this is why they, 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 um, they have been so close when you think they wouldn't be. Um, and then I show in the, um, in the book, how in a, in a chapter called Atlantic Crossing, how this cult moved in on America. And, and, and this cult um, uh, hides behind um, the network, the massive network in America of um, uh, Zionist organizations and ultra-Zionist organizations, which fund American politics to the most extraordinary extent. To give people an idea of, of how few people we're looking at at the core, the Jewish population of the world is only 0.2% of the human population. And uh, depending how you um, define what a Jewish person is, because there are different definitions, the number is around 16 million in a world population of 7.7 .7 billion. And the people um, in this cult are a tiny fraction of, of those numbers. Um, and through compartmentalization, walling off um, knowledge and keeping people further down the hierarchy, only uh, having the knowledge they need to make their contribution in ignorance of what they're contributing to ultimately, um, it takes a very few people to run this. And, and um, so if you uh, then go into the story of 9-11, both um, before, during, and after, as I have in the trigger, you find that the um, ultra-Zionist um, Mossad, Israeli military, Israeli military intelligence involvement in 9-11 was absolutely central, far more central than the CIA, which is also controlled in its inner core by this same uh, death cult. Um, and uh, the, uh, the chapters in the second half of the book towards the end, which are just a coincidence, question mark, and then just a coincidence two and just a coincidence three, um, are devastating. There's no way you can read those chapters and, and dismiss the idea that um, um, the Israel hierarchy, intelligence and military and political, were not absolutely central to what happened on September the 11th, 2001. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, you make a really ironclad case, and that is a great lane of the base that these ideas came from. And it is just odd because ancient religions and backward spiritual ideas always seem to be at the heart of things. And I'm just driven nuts by like what really drives these ideas. There must be real power there. They wouldn't be so dedicated to it because you'd expect billionaires to just say, well, I'm good. I don't need your weird religion. I, I'm, I'm past all that. But it seems so central to everything that drives them. Well, the death cult is driven by uh, the belief in basically what Satanists believe in. Um, uh, but they hide that within the Judaistic um, religion or secular um, Zionism. Uh, and uh, much of what we call um, the Jewish community and, and Judaism are actually just the um, the screen they hide behind. You know, it's like you've got the Satanists in the Western countries, um, uh, people like the British royal family, for instance, who are, uh, outwardly are um, believers in Christianity. 
So, you know, they're always kind of going to church uh, and, and all that. Well, in public they are. But actually behind the scenes, they don't follow Christianity at all. They follow something very different, uh, Sabbatean Frankism uh, or its equivalent. Um, and so you've got this infiltration. But what, um, what happens, as I mentioned earlier, is that this Sabbatean Frankist death cult has set up out of Israel a phenomenal global web, particularly in the West, of organizations. Uh, you have um, uh, uh, the, perhaps the best known one in the United States, um, the Anti-Defamation League, um, which um, are there to target anyone that is in any way, shape or form, even mildly, getting close to um, uncovering what's happening out of Israel. And they are they use the term anti-Semite. Uh, uh, they've just introduced, and this is ultimately the death cult that's behind this. They've introduced in the last few years a new definition of anti-Semitism, um, which is massively expanded from what it should be, which is uh, uh, discrimination against Jewish people for being Jewish people. That should be what it's defined as. In fact, anti-Semitism itself is a complete misnomer because. Uh, uh, Semite, Semitism, refers to a group of languages in the Middle East, the overwhelming vast, vast, vast majority of which are Arabic languages. So anti-Semitism is in fact saying anti-Arab. This is how the inversion uh, uh, goes into even th uh, those levels of, uh, of deceit. Um, but what this new definition does is expand the uh, definition of anti-Semitism to include criticism of Israel. In fact, it's so expanded now, Greg, that if you talk of a global conspiracy without mentioning uh, uh, Jewish people in any way, shape or form or Zionism in any way, shape or form, you are called an anti-Semite because they say that um, the idea that there's a global conspiracy is an anti-Semitic trope. And therefore, though you're not mentioning Jewish people, you're anti-Semitic because you're indicating that that's what you're talking about. Uh, I mentioned in the book uh, a researcher uh, into 9-11 who um, quite soon after 9-11 just mentioned in an article that um, many witnesses were saying they heard explosions in the buildings before they fell. And um, he was attacked by the Anti-Defamation League. Well, he wasn't saying that there was a Jewish involvement in 9-11 um, uh, in terms of what he was saying in that article. He was just saying that witnesses, which is absolutely true, say they heard explosions. Um, and yet the Anti-Defamation League that's supposed to be there to protect Jewish people from discrimination were in there on his case. Now, this makes no sense, but it does if you know about the death cult and, and how it works. And one of the, you know, one of the amazing things that I uh, detail in the book is the scale of um, ultra-Zionist funding of American politics, both parties. It's just extraordinary. And this is why someone like Netanyahu turns up uh, at, uh, at Capitol Hill and the, um, the, House of, uh, the House of Representatives or the, you know, both houses are actually on their feet like every two minutes giving a, a standing ovation. It's because mm -hmm. they are owned by Israel. Trump is owned by Israel. That's why uh, from the moment he um, was elected, uh, Netanyahu started uh, this uh, process of um, building more and more Jewish only, by the way, settlements on uh is on uh, Palestinian occu uh, illegally occupied land because he knew there was going to be no pushback from the American president. And this is why the American embassy was moved by Trump from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which has a, uh, a massive implications, uh, not least uh, for the Palestinians. And this death cult, as I point out in the book, has had the um, ambition all along to um, remove the, the big mosque um, on what uh, Jews and Christians call uh, Temple Mount in Jerusalem um, and replace it with a rebuilt Solomon's Temple because Solomon um, is in their 
uh, death cult uh, mythology, a black magician, um, and uh, you know, like a like a godlike figure to this cult, um, and um, this moving of the embassy into Jerusalem is a step towards the rebuilding of Solomon's temple, and this is why the the uh, Israeli government um, is systematically moving Palestinians out of the area where that mosque is in, in Jerusalem. It's all part of this process. And now we've reached the point, I've been saying this for so long that this was the goal. Now we're seeing the point where the, uh, the, those extremists that go public in, um, in the uh, Jewish community in Jerusalem um, are saying, that's what we want. We want Solomon's temple back. And, and that's what it's all moving towards. And so you've got this network um, that uh, moved in on America, controls American uh, politics through its funding and other sources of manipulation, that long ago infiltrated the National Security Agency, the Pentagon, and, um, and the CIA, etc., and uh, the uh, institutions of government. And um, they had in the run-up to 9-11, control of every area, as I show in the book, that they needed to control to carry it out and then to cover it up. Hmm. Yes, yes, the level of detail is staggering, and it does seem like this is a metaphysical or spiritual conquest as much as it is anything. Inversion and infiltration are clearly effective tools to keep the target moving and the researchers guessing. And so, Jacob... Frank died in 1791. Obviously, we have to fast forward quite a bit to get up to 9-11, 2001. But where do we see the tentacles of the death cult in the Bush administration, in the, the strategizing and planning of 9-11 itself? Are there particular people we can put in this club? Well, let me give you a, let me give you a sequence. Um, it, this, this won't be short, but it will be... Um, fascinating and devastating if, if people have not heard it before and most people will not have done sure. uh, you can take this back a, a long time but let's pick up the sequence in 1979 in 1979 a guy called Issa Harel who was known as the father of Israeli intelligence gave an interview to a American journalist and predicted that um, Arab terrorists were going to attack New York's biggest building um, in the same uh, 1979, Benjamin Netanyahu began to organize international terrorism conferences. First one was in um, Jerusalem in 1979. The second one was in the United States in 1984, in which um, he was calling for a war on terror and for preemptive strikes on terror states, as he called them. And he put all this in a book called War on Terrorism uh, or, or, or Terrorism, How the West Can Win. Um, and then um, in 1996, when Netanyahu was prime minister of Israel, um, he um, ordered a study, a report, headed by a guy called Richard Pearl. This report was called A Clean Break, A New Strategy for Securing the Realm, securing the realm being Israel. And Richard Pearl, of course, was very much involved in American politics and had a very significant um, role in the Pentagon at the time of 9-11. <coughs> Excuse me. In this um, clean break document, he um, called for um, a invasion of Iraq to remove Saddam Hussein. <coughs> and... Uh, to um, create circumstances in which there was inter-Arab conflict. The document said it would be good to have every kind of inter-Arab conflict for the benefit of Israel. He mentioned Syria, he mentioned Iran, and so on. Then a year later, after this document was um, produced for Netanyahu, Richard Pearl, same man, and um, another group of um, ultra-Zionists in the United States 
created a organization called the Project for the New American Century. This was co-founded by two ultra Zionists called Bill Crystal and Robert Kagan. And in this organization were Dick Cheney, who would be the de facto president on 9-11, um, Donald Rumsfeld, who would be the defense secretary on 9-11, Paul Wolfowitz, who would be his deputy, a big ultra Zionist Wolfowitz, and an ultra Zionist called Dove Zakheim, who would be um, the comptroller at the time of 9-11 of the Pentagon in uh, charge of the entire Pentagon budget. Also uh, there was uh, Richard Pearl in that organization, Clean Break Pearl, and also people like John Bolton, who right up to recently, when he was fired by Trump, um, has uh, been pushing for, um, for you know, attacks on countries like um, Iran. And um, in 1998, um, this same group of people wrote to the then President Bill Clinton and demanded that um, Saddam Hussein be removed as leader of Iraq because of weapons of mass destruction. Remember, that's 1998. Then in 2000, the September 2000, this organization produced a document um, uh, and uh, it uh, called for regime changes using American forces in Iraq, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, North Korea, China, leading to regime change in China uh, and some other countries. And the document said that American forces um, should fight and decisively win multiple simultaneous major theater wars. And they said that this process of transformation, this series of regime changes that I've just um, uh, described, would be slow unless America had a new Pearl Harbor to um, justify the massive increases in military spending and to justify the attacks on these countries. And the, um, the document's uh, wording said this, the process of transformation, this regime change list, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. 12 months to the month after that document was published and nine months after the people that wrote it came to power with Bush, America had what Bush called at the time the Pearl Harbor of the 21st century, 9-11. Um, mm -hmm. Then in 2007, um, General Wesley Clark, former Supreme Allied Commander in, of NATO, um, told a, uh, a television show called um, Democracy Now!, an alternative television show, that days after 9-11, he went to the Pentagon, he met Rumsfeld, he met Wolfowitz, and then he went downstairs and met a general friend of his on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the uniform level of uh, command in the Pentagon. And he said this general said to him, we're going to invade Iraq. Now, remember, this is days after 9-11, and Clark said, I, I said to him, what are we going to invade Iraq for? Is there a connection to 9-11? General said, not that we know of, but we're going to invade Iraq. It's come down from upstairs. So Clark says he goes away and he comes back some weeks later, by which time the United States military is in Afghanistan. And um, he sees the same general and he says to the general, um, why aren't we invaded Iraq? Thought we were going to invade Iraq. And the general said to him, well, it's worse than that, sir. He said, uh, we've just had this from upstairs, Rumfeld's office. We're going to attack seven countries in five years. And he listed the countries. And they were all the countries listed by the Project for the New American Century in September 2000. Then you have the New York Times um, uh, reporting just after 9-11 that the Pentagon Policy Board, which was full of these same people, had met on September 19th and 20th, 2001, to plot the removal of Saddam Hussein. And yet we were told that um, the, the decision to remove Saddam Hussein was taken much later and, and that 
um, could have been called off right up to the invasion in 2003 uh, had Saddam got rid of weapons of mass destruction, which he actually um, uh, didn't, uh, didn't have. And one other thing um, in this sequence, too, immediately after 9-11, immediately after the attacks, I mean, on the morning of the attack, straight after them, uh, a man called Ehud Barak, who had been prime minister of Israel, um, right up to the uh, early um, months of 2001, and was a uh, former head of Israeli military intelligence, went on the BBC. I emphasize this is immediately after the attacks when other people are running around saying, what happened, what happened, who did it? And he told the BBC um, that um, basically the... the, 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 the um, the likely culprit was Osama bin Laden and there was a need to invade Afghanistan, um, which, of course, is exactly what happened. And when you look at the invasion of Afghanistan, there's no way that that wasn't orchestrated and ready, given the time uh, involved, before 9-11 happened, just as the Patriot Act, which was introduced deleting basic freedoms in America... Uh, justified by the 9-11 attacks, was clearly written before the attacks, given how quickly it came out. And the man who wrote that, a man called Michael Shertoff, an ultra, ultra Zionist, um, was the head of the criminal division of the Justice Department, who headed the entire criminal investigation into 9-11, actually non-investigation. Um, then, then you have the 9-11 Commission, which um, was, uh, if you remember, you've just had these extraordinarily horrific attacks on the United States. And yet Bush and Cheney were doing everything they could not to have an official investigation into it. Um, and when public opinion um, pressed them on this and forced them to uh, have an inquiry... Uh, the first head they offered was Henry Kissinger, who, who has been a, 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 an operative in this Sabbatean Frankist cult all his adult life. Um, and when, you know, the public, to say the least, did not find that credible and demanded that Kissinger reveal his clients in his notorious Kissinger Associates operation, um, he stood down because to, you know, reveal his clients would have opened a can of worms that would have, you know, the lid would have not landed till it, it, it reached Mars if um, the truth about the people he was involved in came out. And then plan B of Bush Cheney, i.e. Cheney and those who control Cheney, Bush was just does what he's told. Um, plan B was to um, put a, a guy in charge called Thomas Keane as chairman uh, a man who later said that the 9-11 Commission had been set up to fail, and to put into place the man who really ran the entire show um, as executive director, and that was a guy called Philip Zelico, an ultra, ultra Zionist. And on top of this, you know, um, I, I, as I've been talking about this, and Peter have been reading the book, you know, the people that have followed this might know what I'm about to say, but the vast, vast, overwhelming majority will not know that in the year 2001, 200 Israelis, mostly posing as art students, were um, arrested uh, on suspicion of running a spy ring across America. Mm -hmm. And this spy ring, there was a 140 were arrested before 9-11 and 60 afterwards. And what appears to have been the center of this spy ring um, was in Florida at a place called Hollywood. It just happened to be that that was a major center of operation for the uh, many of the 19 alleged hijackers on 9-11, including Mohammed Attar. You know, they, they were even in streets next to each other, some of them, um, these uh, Israeli um, uh, people in the spy ring and people like Attar. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and the, another central center point for this spy ring was New Jersey, which was another center of operation for um, these um, uh, alleged um, hijackers. And talking of New Jersey, on, on the morning of 9-11, a lady looked out of her window from an apartment block and saw what she said were five men of Middle Eastern appearance um, this is why uh, at the time when only the first tower, the North Tower, was burning and they were filming it and they were whooping and high-fiving and laughing in celebration. And as a result of that, they became known as the Dancing Israelis. And they, um, and two of them turned out to be known Mossad operatives. And the lady reported them to the police and the police got the FBI involved and they were arrested and they were kept for 71 days uh, until the ultra Zionist Michael Shertoff in charge of the whole criminal investigation let them go as he let go all those who were uh, being questioned for being part of this Israeli spying. Uh, and um as I show in the book, many of these uh, people um, arrested and questioned in this uh, spy ring were um, military and military intelligence operatives from Israel, some of them with expertise in explosives uh, and, and, and computers, which was fundamentally part of how uh, 9-11 was pulled off, as I show in the book. Um, then you have um, the after 9-11... Um, Shertoff could uh, block the uh, criminal investigation, but they had a problem with the families, the loved ones of those who died on, uh, on 9-11, because um, they, um, they might want their, um, their uh, you know, compensation, uh, not compensation, their day in court. Mm-hmm. So to avoid this, what happened was um, they set up this compensation fund um, to um, give money to the loved ones of the victims of 9-11 on the agreement to receive the money that they would not take civil action and thus have their day in court. Well, the man who oversaw that victim compensation fund was an ultra-Zionist lawyer called Kenneth Feinberg. And Feinberg actually was also the um, special master for executive compensation who decided who got bailout money after the financial crash of 2008. Hmm. By the way, taxpayer bailout money. Now, the, um, the problem they had then was that nearly 100 families who had lost loved ones on 9-11, um, they uh, refused to take the compensation and they wanted their day in court. They wanted civil litigation. They wanted to uh, have in court what actually happened and have the evidence uh, shown. And um, the man who was put in charge of the civil li- litigation um, was an ultra Zionist judge called Judge Alvin Hellerstein, who, even according to the mainstream media, ran a quote, war of attrition against the families. Um, to stop um, any of them getting to court. And the last um, family to give up was in uh, 2011, when the New York Times reported that um, a, a decision by Hellerstein in relation to the case had just made it impossible for um, the family to continue and the last family um, stopped their litigation. So none of it uh, got um, to court. Then you take into account that the um, the uh, the rubble and the debris from the Twin Towers and also Building 7, the third building to fall on 9-11 at 5.20 in the afternoon, which was not hit by a plane, um, that had enormous potential, fundamental potential, for experts to go in and... Um, see the evidence of what brought the towers down. Instead of that, under, again, the overall control of Michael Shertoff, um, that rubble and debris and steel, what was left of it, um, was taken by an ultra-Zionist company to uh, New Jersey uh, scrapyards. Uh, The New Jersey scrapyards were owned by ultra-Zionists. 
And um, it was then cut up immediately and put on boats to Asia to be smelted. And in the book, I quote um, an extraordinary um, report by the New York Times of um, the scene at these scrapyards when um, experts um, in um, engineering, in all the skills you need to um, establish what actually brought the towers down, that they were um, at the scrapyards and the, di the, the, the grabbers were coming down and uh, were, were, were um, grabbing the, you know, the steel, the debris, and moving it as they were preparing it for shipment. And the New York Times article describes how the, um, these experts um, were running into the rubble when the, um, and the piles of debris when the digger moved away, desperately looking for um, a, um, anything that would be useful in establishing um, how the buildings came down. And then as the digger, uh, as the uh, grabber came back, uh, basically running for their life away from the rubble um, so they didn't get hit by it. Now, if you can um, describe um, a scene more absolutely contemptuous of those who died on 9-11 and their loved ones left behind, then I'd really like to hear it because I can't think of one. And then you, you look at um, those that were the company that was running the security at um, Boston Logan Airport and at um, Newark, New Jersey. And it was a subsidiary of a company called um, ICTS that was set up and run by Israeli Mossad and um, domestic intelligence Shin Bet agents. Um, that was that was overseeing the security at those airports. Um, what's more, in 1987, um, a um, company that was uh, run again by Mossad and military intelligence agents from Israel was um, bidding. It's called um, Atwell Security. And um, it was um, bidding for the um, contract to um, take over the security of the Twin Towers. Um, and it was um, uh, at what was a, a subsidiary of um, a, a, a company um, run by a guy called Shaul and Eisenberg, who was a long, long operative. Um, in um, uh, covert operations with um, Israeli Mossad and Israeli uh, military and military um, intelligence. Um, they um, got the contract from the ultra-Zionist controlled New York Port Authority to take control of the um, security at uh, the Twin Towers. Um, but they lost the contract when it was revealed that the head of the company... Um, was actually a, um, a former um, intelligence operative in Israel who had a very dodgy um, background in terms of some of the things he did um, uh, while uh, being uh, a, a central figure in Israeli intelligence. But then, after the 1993 um, uh, bombing of the World Trade Center, the uh, ultra Zionist still, and right the way through to 9 11 and beyond, controlled New York Port Authority, decided that they were going to revamp the security at the World Trade Center as a result of that um, bombing. And they gave the contract to an ultra Zionist company called Kroll Inc., which was um, the uh, uh, running the security right from then and across 9-11. Uh, also in 1983, an ultra-Zionist uh, called Morris Greenberg, who ran this um, insurance giant, AIG, he bought into um, Kroll Inc. in 1993 and became a, a partner. And this is the same Morris Greenberg 
who secured the insurance for um, Larry Silverstein, the ultra-Zionist who uh, bought the lease on the World Trade Center just before 9-11, weeks before, and increased the security in, um, in the case of a terrorist attack on those towers. Uh, Maurice Greenberg um, uh, sorted out the terrorist insurance for um, Silverstein, but then sold it on, reinsured it, with 24 other companies who actually took the hit and not Greenberg. Mm. And um, Silverstein um, ended up, um, and a guy called Frank Lowy was involved as well, the, uh, the guy of Westfield Moles. Um, Silverstein, um, his uh, personal investment into uh, buying the lease and the first down payments on the lease of the Twin Towers was $14 million. His insurance payout as a result of the attacks was $4.56 billion. Uh, it also mm. turns out that Silverstein was a close friend of Benjamin Netanyahu. They used to talk on the phone every Sunday. Mm. Um, and uh, this is this has come from sources like the Haaretz newspaper in, um, in, uh, in Israel. So, you know, wherever you look, Greg, um, and I'm only even now scanning the surface, wherever you look, it is impossible not to see that this ultra-Zionist network, which I say is ultimately um, controlled by this death cult, um, it's impossible to deny that they were not centrally involved in, um, in the attacks of 9-11. And as a result of the 9-11, they got all the things that they wanted in terms of um, involvement, uh, American involvement in, in the Middle East and, and all the wars and regime changes that have followed. Right. Right, man, that is quite a breakdown. There are so many moving parts. You're really great at laying them out clearly. And as you say, we can see how these philosophically aligned people are in every key position. It's very suspicious. And when it comes to the destruction of the Twin Towers themselves, we know it wasn't planes. We know it wasn't jet fuel. And honestly, even professional demolition doesn't explain the lack of seismic data from the impact or the odd melted metal on nearby cars and the fact that you have a Nikola Tesla section in the trigger I'm guessing you think that there might be a little bit more to it as well possibly well I mean the the, the classic um the obvious controlled demolition was building seven building seven also known as the Solomon building um like I said earlier was not hit by a plane and it was a 47 story steel frame building and um we're told it was brought down, and this is the official story. I, I know it's staggering, but the official story of 9-11 is staggering. Um, we're told that a 47-story steel frame building fell because of an office furnishings fire. That's the official story. Um, at making Building 7 the only steel frame building in the history of architecture and engineering before or since... To um, to bring uh, to be brought down by fire, uh, and uh, it's the most obvious controlled demolition. If you go on YouTube and put in "Building Seven Collapse," you'll see it's a you know obviously controlled demolition. In fact, Larry Silverstein told us it was because he was interviewed on um, PBS in a documentary about 9/11, and he said that. Um, on that afternoon, he was approached by the uh, fire commander, as he called it, um, and told that the, they were struggling to contain the fire in Building 7. And um, they decided, uh, said uh, Silverstein, that, you know, there's been such a loss of life today. Uh, let's just pull it. Let's just pull the building, which, of course, means uh, demolish it. Well, there's a few things to that. First of all, this fire commander has never, ever come forward and said, yes, I had that conversation. So he's, he's a mystery man for a start. And secondly, you don't uh, bring down a building. A, the fire department doesn't bring down a building. Controlled demolition experts do. And secondly, that um, they have to spend weeks in a building of that size putting the charges in the right places to make it fall on its own footprint and not topple over, which is exactly what Building 7 did. 
And then, um, I, you know, I was writing this in my first book on 9-11 called Alice in Wonderland of the World Trade Center Disaster. It came out in, in 2002. But um, in the run up to this year's 9-11, just a few weeks ago, the uh, University um, of Alaska Fairbanks uh, produced the, um, the report that has taken it for four years to compile into whether fire brought down the building, which is what the, uh, the government claim. And their um, report, um, after four years, said no way, no way that fire brought down Building 7. Now, the 9-11 Commission and the ultra-Zionist guy running it, Philip Zelico, uh, they had a big problem with Building 7 because, you know, they couldn't really put in the official report, which many, many people would read, that it was brought down by an office furnishings fire. I mean, you can you can reveal that at, at a press conference uh, uh, and, and it's reported a bit and then forgotten. But you don't really want that in a 9-11 Commission report that's going to stand the test of time and it's going to be referred to ongoing because it's so ludicrous. So the way Zellico got around it is that although three buildings fell on 9-11, the 9-11 Commission report only mentions two of them. <laughs> right. The Twin Towers doesn't mention Building 7 because it couldn't explain the, the collapse without controlled demolition. Uh, so, um, and then you've got the Twin Towers, like you say, uh, and this, these are 110-story buildings. No way in the world they were brought down by um, what, what, what we were told, which was a um, fire from the, uh, from the planes. And, you know, I mentioned a tape um, of, uh, of um, fire officers, firefighters, that was not revealed for a year after 9-11, that um, was communications by fire officers right up in one of the towers at the seat of the fire, right there. And in this tape, because... Before this tape came out, the official story was that firefighters didn't get anywhere near that level. And in this tape, the fire um, officer is talking about s basically small pockets of fire that have to be dealt with. But there was no raging inferno. Other witnesses that survived and, and uh, saw that said there was no raging inferno. Because um, if you look at... Um, the South Tower, especially, and that scene that no one will ever forget of the plane hitting the tower on live television and the massive explosion. Well, that massive explosion was the fuel burning off outside the building, most of it. And therefore, there wasn't that much fuel to burn off in the building itself. Um, and when again you see the buildings come down, what we're told is that um, the buildings came down because the top started to fall and it pancaked down, putting more and more pressure on the floors below, and that's how it collapsed. Well, okay, so explain to me why the towers fell in free fall speed. The speed it would take to take, say, a billiard ball 110 floors up and just drop it. And the, 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 um, the towers fell in basically the same speed that it would take that billiard ball untouched to hit the ground. And when right, you, no when, resistance. When, no resistance. And, and when you look at the towers um, uh, coming down, you see that the floors below are not there by the time the floors above or the debris above comes down and and so you can see why they came down in free fall speed because the resistance was being removed before that which would be resisted actually reached that point now that only happens with controlled demolitions now as you say um you could um explain this with uh, literally the uh, usual form of controlled demolition, which is charges in the right places. And as building demolition experts have said, you wouldn't need that many. You'd just need them on the right places for the building to fall. Um, but there are um, uh, some detailed 
um, explanations, not least by a, a lady called Dr. Judy Wood, um, that um, suggests that actually what brought the, uh, the towers down was um, some form of directed energy weapon. Now, interestingly, in my first book in uh, 2002, Alice in Wonderland, I do um, have a section uh, asking that question and pointing out the fact that um, that would um, absolutely turn those buildings to dust, which is what we saw, because basically um, what these directed energy weapons do is um, deconstruct the structure of matter. It basically just makes it disintegrate. And if you if you look at the towers when they fell, uh, it, it was it was like um, it was like a fountain. If you look at it, it was like a fountain um, that, uh, uh, coming out from the top and and, and going out uh, a fountain of dust as as the as as they fell. It was an extraordinary um, thing to, to to look at. And so I, I think there's a a, a a very very good case that. Um, Directed energy weapons could have been um, absolutely uh, involved in the, 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 the towers coming down. Right. It's really hard to identify a technology we haven't seen used, but so often there's a strange physics that's left out of the mainstream, well, this odd is, technologies, and they seem to coincide with the people who have these occult beliefs. Yeah, this is the point, Greg. Uh, I've been making this point for you know nearly 30 years. The cutting edge of technology that we see in the public arena is not the cutting edge of technology that uh, is um, available to uh, those in the shadows and those in the in the inner core of the military. And uh, it's one of the things I've said in the book, you know, to understand what um, technology they had at the time of 2001, you have to look at the technology that's that's emerged in the public arena many, many, many years afterwards. And now, of course, um, directed energy weaponry um, is is coming into the mainstream, that that's what the military have, not just in America, but in places like Russia and China um, uh, as, as well. Um, and so you, um, you have this... Um, you have this technology, which if you use it and the public do not know that you have it or it actually exists, then they're going to dismiss any suggestion of from someone who's saying this is how it was done because they're going to think it was impossible. Well, it may have been with the technology publicly available in 2001, but certainly not behind the scenes. Um, this technology has been known for a very long time. And like you say, Nikola Tesla who died in a New York hotel room in 1943, um, had developed this technology um, well before he died um, that could um, disintegrate uh, matter. He talked about um, being able to cut the, uh, cut the earth in half with this, um, with this technology. So um, it's uh, absolutely existed. And by the way, when Tesla died in that hotel room in, um, in 1943, um, there was a raid by the feds um, that uh, took away much of his material and it was um, uh, looked at by the, the, by the authorities, by the feds. And um, the, um, the, the John in uh, Donald J. Trump refers to um, an uncle who, um, who was the man who looked through those Tesla papers and those Tesla documents laying out this sort of technology. Right. Crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Man, and, you know, I guess on the subject of Trump, you mentioned that Trump was selected by this death cult. Well, are there other big members of this death cult working today? Have they got agents in the current administration beyond just the puppet president? I would assume so. Oh, absolutely. He's surrounded by them. Um, and I'm not saying that Donald Trump is an uh, necessarily um, an active member of this cult. He's just been brought. See, the, the, the people that are brought to power as presidents and prime ministers at best are the small fry of the cult and, and often are not in the cult at all. They're just, you know, gophers. They're just uh, puppets. And uh, so um, the reason uh, they wanted Trump 
And I was saying this not being wise after the event. I was saying this during the election campaign in 2016, that Trump is not there by accident uh, being a maverick um, uh, who wants to drain the swamp. He's, he's actually uh, being, being brought through. You see, when you look at um, the, uh, the documents and the emails that came out through WikiLeaks showing that the, um, the DNC, the Democratic uh, National Committee, uh, manipulated events to stop Bernie Sanders winning the nomination to take on Trump. Uh, in favour of the person they wanted, Hillary Clinton. Um, and therefore, they made sure that, um, that Sanders couldn't win. When you see that, are we really saying that when Trump starts out in the Republican nomination process, with, uh, what was it, 16 people, something like that, to start with, that, that, um, that he couldn't be stopped by the Republican Party hierarchy, if that's what they really wanted? Um, but he somehow ends up winning the nomination uh, because he was he was the chosen one. And, and they, they wanted to bring him to power for a number of reasons. Now, Hillary Clinton would have been certainly acceptable to them, by the way. But ideally, they wanted Trump because of the next stage of this um, takeover of America. Uh, they wanted him for two major reasons. One, he um, is an absolute Israel phobe. Um, and, uh, you know, he's got, he's surrounded by ultra Zionists in his administration. Um, and, uh, as he was in the Trump, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, his company, the Trump operation. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, some of the people are the same, like, um, uh, Greenblatt and, uh, uh, um, David Friedman, who's the American ambassador to Israel, actually the Israel ambassador to America, if the truth be told. Um, and uh, so, so that was good. And and from day one, he did as they wanted him to do, which is all the things he's done for Israel ever since. But they also wanted him to be a figure of hatred that would divide America, because they wanted a civil war in America, um, verbal uh, 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 and eventually um, violent. And what we're looking at, Greg, is the development in America of um, Marxism. Um, as I mentioned in the book, Karl Marx was a asset of this Sabbatean Frankist cult. Karl Marx was a Jewish man who converted to um, uh, another religion, uh, exactly in line with what Sabbatean Frankists do. Um, and uh, you see, you've got two ways of the few controlling the many. You've got capitalism, which is which means you control the many by centralizing control of money, which means you control choice, which means you control freedom of anyone that doesn't have it or as much as you do. Um, and that's what we call the one percent. And that's one way for the few to seize power over the rest. But there's another way, which is to um, build a structure of governmental hierarchical control, which we call um, Marxism, communism. The uh, don't scare the children version is called socialism. Uh, and that creates a structure um, in which the few sit at the top, as in the Soviet Union, for instance, as in China today, that dictate events. So either way, capitalism or Marxism, the few are controlling the many. But Marxism is actually the more um, efficient way because the very hierarchy gives you power over everyone else. The trick, the mind trick, because it's all a psychological trick, is to paint Marxism, communism, socialism as government of the people. Um, and so what you've got in America is the development of Marxism which is being presented as uh, a government of the people. And this is the mentality that's taken over the Democratic Party completely. You take um, Biden out of the Democratic um, list of candidates. You take Tulsi Gabbard out. And what you're left with are representatives of this Marxist philosophy. Even if they don't believe in it, that's what they're pushing. 
um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her Green New Deal, uh, which is being introduced to save the world from the hoax of climate change caused by human activity, um, is is a Marxist uh, um, manifesto. Um, and so if you look at the techniques of Marxism, and uh, there was a guy... Um, operated out of Chicago called Shaul Alinsky, um, who was a, quote, community organizer, ultra-Zionist, and, um, of course, out of the same Chicago and another community organizer was Barack Obama. Um, accident? No chance. Um, people like Hillary Clinton and uh, Nancy Pelosi were followers of Alinsky. And he wrote um, he wrote a book detailing the techniques of Marxism, basically, whereby um, you, um, the techniques to transform a society. And what he says in the book is you don't target faceless bureaucracy. You don't target um, corporations. You, you pick a person, a personality, and you focus all, everything that's wrong that you want to change on that one person. And so by doing that, you unite on your side lots of people who may have disagreements, but unite them behind the hatred of the target figure. And you see this in one form in um, George Orwell's 1984, um, where they have this guy, Emmanuel Goldstein, who Big Brother says everyone must hate because he's the enemy of the people. Um, and so what they've done with Trump is they've created him as Emmanuel Goldstein, the man that the opposition hate, that personifies everything. And then on Trump's side, you've got people supporting Trump who basically see the other side in the same black and white terms. And so you have this division, very clear division in America now, between those who love Trump and those who hate Trump, which is basically what politics in America has become. Do you love Trump or hate Trump? Mm -hmm. um, and and so um, the, uh, the, the, the situation with, um, with Trump was that, you know, when they put these puppets into position they'll pick them on the basis of they have many things about them and in their own opinions that the the cult wants to happen in the period that they're in office but with most of them who are not 100 percent knowing members of this cult these puppets will have other instincts and other opinions that are not in line with the agenda and it was very clear to me anyway during um the election campaign, that Trump did not genuinely see the point of antagonism and conflict with Russia. Um, but what this cult wants is a conflict between the West and Russia, China, and Iran, and any other allies of Russia, China. That's where they're, they're, they're trying to lead it. Um, and, um, and therefore, they didn't want any rapport with Russia. So the moment that... Um, Trump got elected, the Russiagate thing started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and what happened? Trump would not, was not going to get any uh, closer to Putin and Russia because people would say, look, he's Putin's puppet. Look, they're getting closer uh, you know, uh, uh, in public. So they, they achieved that end. Um, and uh, you know, um, Trump imposed um, sanctions on Russia that no other president has ever done. Um, and so... Uh, Overwhelmingly, however, Trump is, is doing the job that they want. What I found interesting was a bit of pushback from Trump over Iran uh, and uh, the sacking of um, John Bolton, Project for the New American Century, um, who was pushing for an attack on Iran. You'll remember a few weeks ago, um, it was revealed that uh, planes were actually virtually in the air, if not in the air, to attack Iran before Trump pulled them back. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the reasons that Trump pulled them back, I suggest, was actually a television program, um, Tucker Carlson Tonight. I watched that very program um, and it was just as, as this um, this attack was about to happen. And of course, Trump's always watching the television, not least Fox News. 
And um, I remember Tucker Carlson was pointing out that if Trump does attack Iran, he's got no chance of winning the next election. Because, of course, lots of people supported Trump because in the election campaign, he's saying, um, we've got to put an end to these regime change wars. So mm -hmm. if you'd have attacked Iran, and there's mu enormous pressure on him still to do so, by the way, um, then um, he would have lost a lot of support. Um, uh, and uh, I think that was very influential in the very late decision to, to withdraw the earlier decision to go ahead. And, right. Maybe um, that's why they're coming at him with impeachment now. It's like, come on, man, do what we say. Well, this is the next thing you see. Um, you know, uh, Russiagate was obviously going to go nowhere. I wrote that in a book in 2016 that this Russiagate was an absolute uh, hoax. Um, and that's died down because of uh, the Mueller report. Uh, couldn't find any evidence. And of course, Robert Mueller, let's not forget, was the uh, head of the FBI appointed just two weeks before 9-11 who, under Michael Chertoff, oversaw the um, non-investigation of 9-11. Let us not forget that. So now they've come out with another one. Um, and this guy, Adam Schiff, ultra-Zionist. See, what, what, what they've got, um, uh, Greg, is they control both sides and th th thus they control the game. So you've got the ultra-Zionists in the Democratic Party who are pushing against Trump. You've got the ultra-Zionists in the uh, Republican Party and the Trump administration who are pushing for Trump, at least on the surface. And, and so you've got the, the, the basically people answering to the same masters, um, controlling both sides. And this is most um, obvious with the, um, the funding, the massive funding of so-called progressive politics is actually regressive. Um, they call it liberal. The last thing is is, is liberal. I, I'm a, I'm a liberal in the dictionary sense of the word, in that I'm for maximum freedom, maximum freedom of speech, maximum freedom of lifestyle, maximum freedom of choice. I have a simple philosophy on life: do what you like, so long as you don't impose it on anyone else. That's liberalism, but that's not what we've got. Progressivism is not liberalism. It's um, totalitarianism. Um, um, hidden behind the, uh, the, the fake um, liberal facade. And, and so you've got this billionaire, George Soros, funding the left, or what, what claims to be the left. I, don't, I say it's not for reasons I've explained there. Mm -hmm. And you've got Sheldon Adelson, another ultra-Zionist, who is funding Trump, biggest funder of Trump, and the, and the Republican Party. So... Um, they control both sides. They control the game. And, and people like uh, uh, Trump and these Democratic uh, would-bes are just pawns in a game. The one that stands out in the Democratic Party who's not um, uh, pushing this agenda is Tulsi Gabbard. And what happens? They try to get her off the, they try to get her off the stage. They've done it once. I think yeah. she's back on the next debate. But they tried to get it once. With the, the DNC again trying to uh, crush a candidate. It's desperate not to, um, to get um, it, uh, 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 into office. Because if, if Gabbard went against Trump, she would win, I would say. But um, if it was left to an open election of the, of the people, I think she would win with, when, when what Gabbard is saying really um, got out among the people. And, and yeah. she, she, interestingly, is the one Democrat who has come out and said, this impeachment thing, or there are there are others, but the one uh, candidate who's come out and said uh, this impeachment thing on Trump over Ukraine is, is ridiculous and it's going to damage the Democratic Party and it's going to um, uh, damage the country. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not saying I agree with everything that Tulsi Gabbard uh, says um, at all. What I'm saying is, and I don't, you know, so, say vote for this person, vote for that person. That's not the role of the alternative media, in my view. Um, right. But um, what she's saying about the um, ending this nonsense of uh, overseas wars and regime changes, uh, she is absolutely genuine about, not least because she's, she's experienced it uh, uh, personally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you mentioned the Green New Deal a bit ago, and I did want to mm -hmm. ask you about climate change because you speak on this so well. And of course, we know they use problem, reaction, solution. And when it comes to this aggressive push that climate change is man-made, the catalyst for it, the reason for it is, as you've put it before, that they want to have centralized power over every minute detail of your life. And 
lifestyles, and they're going to say it's to save the planet. We saw one example of this in California where people are getting fined or ticketed because they've watered their garden. I yep. mean, that's just one example, but how bad can this get? Do you see it getting? Well, th th this is the whole point, you know. Um, when I was saying um, decades ago now in the books and talks that um, human-caused climate change was a hoax, um, people, understandably, it was a very reasonable question, would ask the question, well, why would they want to hoax that? And I said at the time, because they want to uh, justify the centralization of power, Marxism, um, and the f control of the fine detail of our lives, justified by we must save the planet. Um, and that's exactly what is unfolding. That's what the Green New Deal is about. We have an organization in Britain called Extinction Rebellion that has been uh, shutting the streets of London, protesting against climate change. Their agenda for what they demand must happen is basically a Green New Deal. And that's what you're looking at. You're looking at um, a hoax uh, to justify the centralization of power and over absolutely the fine detail of people's lives. You've given a very good example, but I mean, the fine detail. And uh, they've introduced this lady, Greta um, Thunberg, this 16-year-old, um, as a front for it. Uh, um, what they're doing to that girl is child abuse, in my view. Um, and... Um, they're talking about a 16-year-old has done this and is behind these global uh, uh, school children strikes uh, over climate change. She's not. She's not. It's being orchestrated by adults with a very dark agenda. She's just the, she's just the puppet. Um, and, um, you know, if you look into the background of Greta uh, Thunberg then you start hitting people like George Soros and Bill Gates and um, uh, foundations that they uh, fund. It's the usual suspects. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've got, um, you know, she, she keeps saying, uh, Greta Thunberg, um, you know, look at the science, you know, the science is settled, been settled for 30 years. It's not even nearly settled. In fact, with every passing year, the claims start to more and more unravel. But one thing you'll notice, Greg, is that when she's interviewed um, in these softball interviews, she's never asked, OK, so what is the science? Tell us, tell us the science that we must believe in. Because if they did, she would not know where her next word is coming from. And they've, they've picked this 16-year-old uh, because... You don't um, interview, hardball interview, 16-year-olds. How could you interview a girl like that? Well, hold on a minute. If she's or being the front person for millions of kids um, going on strike over climate change that's not being caused by humans, um, and um, you're seeing interviews now with crying young children in... Um, deep anxiety that they think the world's going to end. You've got uh, unbelievably uh, um, ridiculous uh, people like Ocasio-Cortez saying the world will end in 12 years. Um, and uh, the uh, whole um, thing that's going on with uh, Greta Thunberg as the front person, then you have to question her. You don't have to be aggressive, but she has to be asked the questions to justify what she's saying and demanding. Then you ask, how does a, a girl um, from Sweden, a 16-year-old, end up um, addressing the Davos um, World uh, Forum Summit, World Economic Forum Summit, of the richest, most influential people in the world? How does she end up addressing um, the UN? How does she end up meeting the Pope? How does all this happen? Because it's being orchestrated. Um, right. and, and because it's being orchestrated and because of what is happening as a result of what she's doing or being told to do, um, she ought to be questioned to justify what she's saying. But, but this is what they won't do because those behind her know what will happen if they do. And uh, the one good thing about her address to the UN, 
um, is that um, it was so over the top that even some politicians have started to push back on her now in places like France and, uh, and, and Germany and others, started to push back because basically um, there was something so sinister, I would use that word, about that address um, that, you know, a lot of people are now beginning to say what's going on here. And, and you know, I've got in front of me here um, a series of books when she talks about the science One's by a guy called Dr. Tim Ball, um, who's um, very much um, uh, into the whole um, climate change science. And it, this book is called um, Human Caused Global Warming, The Biggest Deception in History. Uh, there's another book here by a polar bear expert called Dr. Uh, Susan Crockford. And um, this book is called The Polar Bear Catastrophe That Never Happened. Another book... Um, called The Climate Chronicles by a meteorologist in America called Joe Bastardi, who um, by his own admission is a complete weather nerd and has been since he was a kid uh, and is always poring over climate records, you know. Um, and he's gone back and uh, looked at the um, weather events that are now being blamed on human-caused global warming. And he's shown in this book that they were happening decades and decades and decades ago in just the same way. And uh, all these things about um, increases in hurricanes, increases in um, tornadoes, increases in all these things are simply not true. Uh, and the climate record shows it. Uh, fewer people by far are dying from climate events um, than ever before. And then there's another book by a guy called Mark uh, Murano who looks at the political manipulation behind this, a book called The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change, um, uh, uh, who, do, who, who, who explains how the whole thing has been pulled off. Um, so um, there's some science, Greta, which you will not know anything about because it will be kept from you. Right, right. Well said. Those are great resources. And to try to fit one more kind of curveball question in here, just to have you talk about something that for people who listen, okay. uh, maybe haven't heard you talk about before. Okay. But you were mentioning these uh, Democratic candidates. Of course, Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, Cortez, all compromised. Um, but I am interested in this Andrew Yang guy. Of course, universal basic income, there's an argument that it bolsters centralized power and dependence on the system. But with his freedom dividend, he's talking about getting money from the tech companies, from Google, Facebook, Amazon, Uber, and giving it back to the people. And I think that's an interesting idea because these are the kind of titans driving us into the digital dystopia. Maybe we should get a little something back. But I'm curious your thoughts on those ideas and yeah. and just those ideas, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not. Uh, 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 a right-wing rabid capitalist um, um, I believe in social justice I believe in equality of opportunity for everybody irrespective of colour, sexuality, culture religion, any of it that's where I'm coming from um, but the emphasis there is on equality of opportunity um, what Marxism wants is equality of outcome. Mm -hmm. And equality of outcome is a race to the bottom. It destroys human creativity. So there is a difference. I want equality of opportunity for everybody. So everyone's got the best chance and then they use their own initiative and drive and creativity to take it from there. Um, that's... Um, you know, encouraging people to use their skills and their creativity and their drive and not suppressing it and saying everyone must be the same, which is what Marxism and this overwhelmingly uh, Marxist democratic wing is doing. I mean, you know, the whole Democratic Party is not like this, um, but it, it's that Marxist wing that is driving the party now. Um, and... In terms of universal basic income, now, 
Yang may be a, a lovely guy. I don't know him. He may be a lovely guy. And what he may be saying is genuine. And you can make a an argument for that. In fact, given the fact that um, jobs on a monumental scale are going to be taken over by AI and technology uh, in, in, on an extraordinary scale, like I say, in the next few years and decades, some form of um, um, income has to be um, sorted out. But we also have to be streetwise. And this is why it's so important that people um, understand the agenda, understand the forces behind it, and understand how it works. Um, so you can look at let's 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 take a um, let's take a, a, a microphone, a radio microphone, or a camera, or a notebook for a journalist. Um, those things are neutral. Um, they can be used for good or ill. Mm-hmm. It's how you use them. They are not in and of themselves um, negative or evil. And it's the same with a universal basic income. Um, I think it would be great, um, and I would certainly feel better about the world, if um, everyone had a level of income that meant that no one um, went hungry, no one had to sleep in the streets. I think that would be a good thing, as long as um, initiative to go beyond that was available. Right. Um but universal basic income can also be, and I say that's what the agenda of the cult is. And I'm not saying this is Yang's agenda. I'm saying the agenda of the cult. Um, that's what the agenda is um, planned to introduce for this reason. When the jobs have gone, or most jobs have gone, and there's no um, other form of um, earning a living, then you are surviving on the basic income. Now, first of all, that ain't going to be a lot of money, and therefore you're going to live quite a low level of um, life uh, in terms of uh, financial uh, life. And secondly, it opens up the way, and this is what the agenda is, to say, well, yeah, okay, you're going to get the basic income, but only if you do what you're told. If you stand out of line and challenge the government and criticize the government, you're not going to get a basic income then. Only if you if you toe the line are you going to get the basic income, and then if you say, well, you know, I want my freedom, so you can stick your basic income, and then they'll say to you, well, how are you going to put food on the table then? Now, how are you going to do that? And and so you know these things, uh, there's nothing easier to manipulate, Greg, than um, genuineness that isn't streetwise, and this is this is why it's so important that people find out about the forces that are really running the world and to what end and their methods of psychological manipulation because then they'll have the streetwise knowledge to pick out the uh, the traps and universal basic income is a trap um, if the world was run by genuine open-hearted loving people then um Universal basic income would be a good thing, but it's currently run by psychopaths. Right, right. And and yeah. psych- psychopaths are not interested in you having basic income so that you have food on the table. They're interested in you having basic income so they have the means to control everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Implement anything you want with good intentions, but if you have this overarching control cult running things, they're going to twist any tool for their purposes and. It does seem like there's an element, whether it's a psychological trick to get people to accept a new minimum standard. Yeah. Because we all often make more than a thousand dollars a month, but ex- ex- it's also ex- scary ex- that we don't have the safety net for those jobs that are going to go away. But ex- exactly this is the that dilemma. But it's 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 a very simple thing, um, a tyranny that hasn't yet quite got the control to enforce its tyranny totally is not going to tell you that what it wants to happen are elements of its tyranny. They're going to tell you there are, it's a wonderful thing. So they're not going to tell you that the basic income, which uh, people like Zuckerberg are now um, supporting, which is 
a big, big, big red flag because <laughs> yeah. this death cult absolutely controls Silicon Valley. That's where all the censorship's coming from. This death cult is not just um, controlling what it's doing and introducing. It's controlling the exposure of what it's doing and why. Um, uh, because it controls Silicon Valley. And as I say and, and point out in the latter part of the book, um, a new Silicon Valley is being developed very, very fast in Israel um, and a place called Beersheba. Uh, that's one of the most, uh, you know, that that is one of the most fascinating parts of the book, book in many ways, how Silicon Valley is being prepared to move, move locations in terms of where it's ultimately operating out of. Um, and uh, this all fits in with the death cult. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you want to introduce a smart grid system, which is unfolding all around us every day, whereby you um, connect the human brain to artificial intelligence, thus artificial intelligence becomes the human mind, um, then you can, if you can control that grid from a central point, which you can, then from that central point, you can control every mind on the planet, as well as every piece of technology which is connected to the same grid. And I right. uh, and I I say that that's planned. That central point is planned to be Israel, uh, and it's planned to be run by the death cult because it's the death cult that's behind not only Silicon Valley, it's behind the smart grid. Mm. <laughs> I mean, you know, in the end, um, what seems to be an incredibly complicated world is actually quite a simple one when you when you break down how, uh, what's happening. Yes, I agree. I agree, and. That is a great breakdown and some definite things to keep in mind on the road ahead. And as we're tying this all together and wrapping it up, and if we're trying to end on a positive note, I know that at our core, we're all infinite awareness having a human experience. But does that mean our only option here is to acquiesce? Is this too big to overcome? Is this a spiritual battle beyond our pay grade? Well, I don't like using the word battle because that's what they want us to do, battle. Um, um, it, but it is a, um, a situation where we have to decide um, which state of consciousness prevails in terms of the way the world is that we live in. Um, I mean, you know, we get into the nature of the world itself. Uh, I mean, it's nothing like we think we're experiencing for a start. But um, what they've done, because... This death cult understands um, how this reality works. It understands who we really are, right? It understands what the body is. And thus, um, it's part of the occult. Now, the word occult simply means hidden. You know, th th there's just because something is occult knowledge doesn't mean it's evil. It means it's knowledge that's hidden. And we go back to the notebook and the camera and the microphone. This occult hidden knowledge can be used for good and it can be used for psychopathic evil. What this death cult has done is hijack this knowledge for itself and basically keep it out of the public arena uh, where the uh, population, the target population, does not have access to it. And what it wants the public to believe, which is what um, materialist science is all about, which is all the, a, a death cult creation, um, is that we are our bodies. We are our name. We are our race. We are our religion. We are our culture. We are our life story. Um, because you're isolating self-identity into... Um, into a, a very small um, bubble of perceived self. And that um, is basically the world of the five senses, which is what the body uh, in our experienced reality, conscious reality, operates in. And the world of the five senses is a tiny, tiny narrow band of not only possibility and reality, it's a tiny band of who we are. These names and life stories and um, races and cultures, sexualities, 
They're not who we are. They're what we're experiencing. That's all. And, and who we are is the consciousness, the awareness that's experiencing them. What this death cult has done is manipulate human perception, which is done by control of the education system. And, you know, control of the education system means you can indoctrinate children to believe the world's going to end, for instance. Um, and you can um, manipulate people to believe that they are what they're experiencing and that is who we are. You're born by accident. You have a few years of conscious reality called a human life and then you die and basically cease to exist. Uh, well, what that creates is a very meaningless feeling about life itself, really, in human life. Um, you know, it's just a cosmic accident, life's a bitch and then you die. Um, and it also limits your sense of self and your sense of potential because you're self-identifying with a tiny, tiny smear of possibility. But when you realize the true I is consciousness and that consciousness can be the size of a pea or it can be infinite in its expression, you realize that um, your power to change events and change your own life is limited only by your perception of the possibility to do that. And so when people start to um, awaken to the I beyond the five sense me, they start to realize that their life becomes more and more synchronistic more and more coincidences start to happen, which put things on a plate to them um, almost without effort um, that weren't happening before. Because as I, I explain in the books in, in some detail, um, our perception of self becomes our experience of reality. If you have a perception of self that you are little me, I have no power, why is it that those people live little me powerless lives, whereas others live much more expansive uh, lives and uh, things happen to them that don't happen to other people? It doesn't mean that they're better than anyone else. It means they're coming from a totally different level of perception of possibility and perception of self-identity. For instance, I'm, I come from the self-identity that I am infinite awareness having an experience. Um, I don't come from the, the self-identity that I am David Icke, born in Leicester, England in 1952. That's my experience. It's not me. I am the consciousness having that experience. And, and when you come from that perspective amazing things start to happen to you not least insights that you you didn't have before because as you expand your sense of self-identity your consciousness subsequently expands and 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 your perceptions uh, are start to be formed by greater and greater expansions of consciousness instead of just the five senses and so you see things you couldn't see before. You see connections that other people don't see, not because you're better than them, but because you're coming from another level of awareness, which you've allowed yourself to become. And that's the point. That's the word, allowed yourself to become. Because if you believe only in five cents me, then first of all, you are limited by that perception in what you can create because that's the world of limitation. That's the world of I can't. But also, and this is the key with the death cult, is if, if, if vast numbers of people are self-identifying the I with the body and its race and its sexuality and its life story and its culture, the potential for divide and ruling the target population is infinite. And um, what you're seeing, Greg, now is Marxism changing. The old Marxism was classically to play the haves off against the have-nots, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and all that stuff. 
What they're doing with this Marxism is they are creating the group conflict between self-identities um, and between races. And therefore, they have far more groups to play off against each other than the old have-have-nots uh, version of Marxism. And this um, explains why, because now, of course, just quickly, you're seeing conflict between feminists and transgender people, transgender activists, not transgender people. Um, and, and so th these self-identities are subdividing and subdividing. This is why this LGBT list of letters is getting longer and longer and longer, because people are subdividing into greater and greater minutiae of self-identity. And therefore, the potential for conflict becomes fantastic. But something else comes from this. When you have the old Marxism of haves against have-nots, the poor and deprived were played off against the what we would now call the billionaires. But under self-identity group conflict Marxism, it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire or a pauper, what matters is, do you support my particular self-identity? And therefore, you've got this bizarre um, alliance now between social justice warriors and billionaire oligarchs from Silicon Valley and people like George Soros. Because as long as the billionaires of Silicon Valley that control the corporations of Silicon Valley and the communications of Silicon Valley and your George Soros's support and fund your self-identity groups, they're one of you. And, and um, you have, therefore, a man in George Soros who uh, said publicly, um, my uh, job is to make money. I do not look at the social consequences of what I do. Um, he is funding social justice warrior groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're taking his money. And if you expose him, they attack you. Right. Um, so you can see this extraordinary psychological manipulation that's going on. And if you're not streetwise to it and how it works and where it wants to take the world, then you're babes in arms, lambs to the slaughter. Because what these kids are doing and the adults that are driving it in terms of human-caused global warming, and it's the hoax of it, is that they are being manipulated out of fear of the end of the world, they're being manipulated into demanding the deletion of their own freedoms. And not only that, the deletion of everyone else's uh, freedoms. As I said on the, um, the internet this week, um, it's not the world that's going to end, kids. It's your freedom that's going to end. That's what this is really all about. Hmm. Man, well, cheers to that. I think that's a pretty good thing to leave people with. These are troubled times that require us to stay sharp and avoid the traps that they set. And, and of course... And oh, also, just, just very quickly, Greg, and also uh, going into what we've just been talking about, um, they don't work so hard to keep us in a minutiae of consciousness and self-identity because it's a bit of fun. They do it because it's fundamental to them achieving their end. And if people would just shift their self-identity from I am my labels, as I call them, to I am the consciousness having the experience of those labels, an infinite eternal consciousness that is in a... a, a um, is in a, 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 a journey of exploring forever, forever, and this is just a tiny experience that we're having, that very shift in perception of the I would change the world because of all that would come from it. Mm. Yes, I guess to some extent, freedom is a state of mind. Mm. Well, <laughs> very 
Great talking to you today. I mean, the trigger is the book. DavidIke.com is the website. So much content there. I'm sure you have uh, another project in the works already. Maybe you could give us a preview before we really call it in. Oh yeah, well, I'm 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 gonna start another book in um, in uh, uh, just about maybe about three 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 weeks, which will be absolutely about solutions and consciousness and um, and becoming the true I. Um, so um, that will be out um, next year. And one other thing we're about to uh, launch is a um, a media channel. Um, Because, of course, we're all faced with uh, the censorship. So we're uh, we're launching a a media channel um, through uh, davidike.com. It's maybe in the the next three weeks or so. And we've already got a phenomenal amount of content, and it's cutting-edge content in all these different areas. Uh, People that are suppressed and... um, censored elsewhere will be on this channel so um that's you know very very exciting for people like me because it's going to give um it's going to give a platform to the cutting edge of knowledge across all these um different subjects which are being um increasingly curtailed um on the uh, by by the silicon valley corporations Right on. That sounds great. I mean, this is a, a revival of a of a project that was attempted before, right? Well, it it well it was attempted before, um, and that was a massive learning process because what came through the door in terms of volunteers um, were some lovely, wonderful people, um, and a lot of um, of basically uh, toxic people who. Um, set out to destroy it, basically, or to use it for their own ends. So that was a massive learning experience. That is uh, very different to what we are uh, doing this time, uh, which is a very small knit group of people um, that um, that have absolutely the right intent and integrity to uh, to make this work. It will work, and uh, it's it, it's got to work because this censorship through Silicon Valley is not something that um, has reached its peak. It's just where it is now. And this death cult runs Silicon Valley. Um, And so the goal, eventually, is to ensure that people anywhere only see and hear what the death cult wants them to see and hear. And that takes us straight into the the pages of 1984, of course, um, which is exactly um, where we're heading. But or well underestimated, as you would expect, <laughs> and underestimated where it was going because in those days he didn't understand the scale of technology that was going to be available. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Man, well, you know, we live and learn. You got noble goals and you're getting uh, more done before breakfast than I do all day. So um, very awesome. You are such a workhorse and a living legend in this quest for truth, man. I appreciate everything you do. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me today and keep fighting the good fight. Real pleasure, uh, Greg. I tell you what, um, the, the, day I, the day I leave this world um, will be um, uh, a few seconds after I've written my last words, I tell you, because I, mm. um, I ain't going anywhere. And um, uh, this is, um, I'm in this for the long haul. And, uh, you know, it's, it, in many ways, it's only just begun. Well, I look forward to following you up to the last word. (laughs) It's going to be a long time from now, Greg, I'll tell you that. (laughs) Indeed. All right, man. Well, have a good one. You too, mate. Thanks. Always a pleasure.